Well, it's actually my great pleasure to be here, um, to see some old friends, to meet some new people. Um, and I would certainly thank both organizers and all the people that are helping put on this conference, for, uh, which is a lot of work, to, uh, to make this a good time for all of us. As, as Alex said, um, there's a lot of experts in the room, but like usual, we're experts on different pieces of mathematics. So um, the talk I'd like to give today is more in the complex analysis direction of, of multi-parameter analysis, which I'll take to mean the umbrella that, that Alex chose that sort of unifies this conference. Um, it is multi-parameter in one real sense that there are two free parameters that we're going to be juggling. And, uh, and that's sort of the new part of the story. It is interesting, I, I hope you agree, that uh, whether we are harmonic analysts, complex analysts, algebraic geometers, things like this, uh, this last uh, example that Alex showed are ubiquitous in math. I don't think it's, um, it's a little sloppy to say, but it's not wrong to say that moving from one to several variables is, um, is somehow finding what the correct notion of principal part of an operator or function is. That's just not clear as soon as you go from one to several variables. Okay, so um, the problem, the sort of big problem that motivates what I'd like to talk to you about today, see if I can see my own screen, <coughs> is uh, the biholomorphic extension problem in more than one variable. So we uh, have two given, say, smoothly bounded domains and a biholomorphic map between them. The basic problem is to determine conditions on the two domains. And those will be boundary conditions of some kind. They're indistinguishable as open sets, which guarantee that F and F inverse extend smoothly to the closures of the domain. This problem phrased in this generality is certainly open. Um, as a reminder, oh, that's just some notation. The main motivation, of course, is that there's no Riemann mapping theorem in d d d d dimensions higher than one. If there was a positive answer to the extension problem, you can then attach differential geometric invariance to the boundary related to the Levy form and decide what two dimensions are biholomorphic. In a certain sense, a formal procedure and not what the talk is going to be about, but that's the main motivation for the question. Um, some of you will know Chern Moser theory on strongly pseudo convex domains. This is an example of that kind of matching of, of invariance. And in general, we might hope for moduli classes of biholomorphically distinct domains, but that's a future project. Sure. I'd like to say that from just an analyst point of view, this is a this is a type of, for lack of a better term, I call a balanced boundary value problem. So uh, E biholomorphic is a very strong interior condition on the map capital F, of course. In two senses, each of the component functions satisfy an elliptic of PDE. And the hypothesis that F is injective is certainly also a form of additional regularity. What do I mean by balanced, in a sense? Well, the smoothness of the boundary, of each of the boundaries, the boundary of omega 1 and omega 2, mean that um, this interior behavior, which is nice and regular, is not being pinched. The analytic pinching is the same as the pinching for this kind of a thing. Uh, you, you would lose control of the, either the elliptic PDE or the injectivity if you had corners. Boundedness of the domain is important because it means that these regularity conditions are not slipping away at infinity. There are very easy, but not going to be talked about examples today, uh, that the problem is false if, if you don't assume smoothness and boundedness. On the other hand, we're going to assume that each of the boundaries is pseudo-convex, which may be a concept to everyone in the room. Um, and it may not. I'm just racing for some space because I think I'll wait till we have some notation before I remind you about what pseudo-convexity is. In words, uh, each of these domains, omega 1 and omega 2, are domains of holomorphy. 
natural domains of existence of holomorphic functions. This is not a natural hypothesis for this problem, right? After all, on non-pseudo convex domains, all holomorphic functions extend past the boundary holomorphically, in particular the component functions of capital F. But we need that assumption at this point, and it's still, it was still another big step to go from some kind of quantitative pseudoconvexity, strong pseudoconvexity, finite type, to the theorem I'm going to talk about today, which is pseudoconvexity, but no quantification of that. Nevertheless, the little question at the end is to suggest that um, it's basically wide open to talk about the, the, the basic problem, but without any pseudoconvexity hypothesis at all. Okay. All right. Uh, in the spirit of warming up, uh, I mentioned that in, in one dimension, the maps do always extend under smoothness and boundedness. And I sketch very quickly a special case. So if you have a smoothly bounded domain omega and it's mapped to the disk by a biholomorphism, look at the point that in, in omega that uh, extends to zero. The so-called Berman projection, which is orthogonal projection from L2 onto its holomorphic subspace. And then just do a little bit of undergraduate complex analysis, essentially the mean value theorem. And you see that the derivative of conformal map, biholomorphic map, those are synonymous in one variable, is a constant times the Bergman kernel um, for the second variable. The integration variable is based at P. So that's really, it really is elementary. And so if you knew that that function on the right-hand side, the Bergman kernel of its uh, non-integrated slot, its free variables, was smooth up to the boundary, then f prime is, and so f is, and you're done. And that fact that's labeled as one is always true, whoops, did I say that? Yes, since one holds, yeah. So that's a consequence of, essentially a consequence of being able to solve the Dirichlet problem with smooth dependence of the, and it's exactly that fact that doesn't happen in general on smoothly bounded pseudoconvex in bigger than one, that's not obvious and wasn't obvious in the field for many, many years. This is a theorem essentially due to Mike Christ. Um, although earlier work of Dave Barrett and Schieselman was were important. Um, it was, and it's still a mystery, by the way. Uh, mysterious in, I mean, I'm not gonna be able to help myself from editorializing throughout the talk. We don't understand where the, in any sense those singularities come from. We have smoothly bounded domains. We're used to, as analysts, situations where singularities propagate, but they have to get started someplace. And this is a very mysterious, I, I think it's fair to say, theorem in our field that the Bourbon kernel is not smooth up to the boundary. Of the Although there are many broad positive classes of domains for which extension is known, singularity is known, and I just list some of the, the authors of the principal works. Pfefferman um, certainly had the breakthrough result in the early 70s on strongly pseudoconvex domains. Bell and Bell and Lagotska understood how to derive Pfefferman's extension theorem from mapping properties of the Bergman projection. And then various regularity results about the Bergman projection on different classes of domains are due to Cohn, Catlin, and particularly Boaz Strauba. Uh, I say particularly because that's the theorem of theirs, which I think I'll mention in passing, um, doesn't have very strong estimates, and yet nevertheless you get regularity. A very crude summarization of these previous results, extension before the work I hope to talk about today, happened, happens, if the boundary is finite type in the sense of, of D'Angelo, or it's not, but the uh, set on which the infinite type points occur on the boundary are, are somehow tame. And the hypothesis that Boaz and Straub mentioned were that the boundary is defined by a plurisubharmonic defining function. The difference between plurisubharmonic defining function turns out to be the whole that I would hope to try to tell today, or that this, this new work tells. And analytically, again, extension happens when the Bergman projection has a good mapping property. All right, so the Bergman projection doesn't have a good mapping property, and so we look for a substitute. 
So what I want to talk about next is, uh, I think I want to stand out here instead, um, is the twisted Bergman projection, so-called. So we have a smoothly bounded domain given by a defining function, R. And I want to consider weighted L2 projections onto um, cosets, not holomorphic functions, but a, a cousin of a holomorphic functions. The weighted inner products are going to be the ones that Again, it's well known to those to, to whom it's well known. Uh, <laughs> like everything else, I guess. Um, this is the Hornander weighting scheme. Uh, it makes curvature terms and in, in estimates a little cleaner to think of the weight as e to the minus w rather than w. Um, and so I remind you of the notation. Anytime we see in, in our chat today a, a subscript of w, that'll be a weight. And it'll be weighted according to this scheme. Now, the substitute for holomorphic functions I want to look at, I want to fix a positive smooth enough function tau and look at the functions not that are annihilated by the, -bar, by the cauchy riemann operator d bar, but those functions so that if you multiply them first by the square root of tau, and tau is positive, so the square root is there just for simplicity of the estimates later on, too, uh, you get zero. Well, this is in one-to-one -one correspondence to the holomorphic functions, but of course there's only one function that's both holomorphic and in this set I'm calling script O super tau, and that's the zero function. And not even constants are mutually, or in both sets, if tau is not trivial. They're simply related, uh, so this new set is related to whole functions just by multiplication. Um, and for when we need to, let's call them the tau twisted holomorphic functions. So tau is a parameter beyond the weight function. Now one thing right away that's interesting is that you can prove a version of Bergman's inequality and get a, a twisted Bergman theory, a twisted weighted Bergman theory, quite easily. It's, it's essentially um, under the, hypo under the hypo certain hypotheses, sorry, on tau and w, it's uh, just like the maybe one application of Jensen's formula, or Jensen's inequality in there. So if I assume that my weight function is locally integrable in a strip near the boundary, and tau is definitely positive, not allowed to have zeros for this discussion, then you get something that is usually called Bergman's inequality. The, for tau twisted holomorphic functions, the, their value at a point, say in a compact set inside of omega, is dominated by the weighted L2 norm of that function. And the constant definitely depends on tau and w, but for any, for crucially, it doesn't depend on f, and otherwise it's not much of an inequality. And for other applications that we'll discuss today, I would just mention this is not, in any sense, the sharp um, hypotheses on w. Uh, this is basically, uh, this little investigation as far as I know, is the uh, first time that people have considered projecting onto other closed subsets of L2 to try to do complex analysis. I mean, of course, there's other projections in the world. <clears throat> and so, really, the remark two is just to hopefully inspire someone to pursue this further. But anyway, all right. Now, uh, we need to have a we need to understand how these uh, twisted w projections transform under biholomorphic maps. So I want to put it, my tau and w, my twist and weight factor on omega 1, and look at the corresponding sigma v on omega 2 through the viholomorphism. And so what we want to do is, is understand the relationship between their two Bergman kernels. And that's just notation. That's talking about what the Jacobian is going to be denoted as. And sometimes we can make our uh, notation a little cleaner by replacing omega sub j by just j. All right, then it's exactly the same transformation formula and proved exactly the same way. So take the formula simply and the uniqueness of the Bergman kernel. So I flash it up very quickly. Again, it's, if, it's, if it is familiar, you'll, you can do the proof in your head. And if it's not, it doesn't really matter. Um, <laughs> well, because for the spirit of the talk, at least, yeah. So we can also express this at the operator level. To, to make one of Bell's ideas clearest, I would like to do that. 
So you look at the operator on the left hand side, script V, sub omega 1, super tau, comma W, by just integration against this Bergman kernel in the normal way. It's the weighted integration because we're looking at weighted L2 spaces. Um, it's not by definition, but it's quite easy to see that it's, that, uh, it's actually orthogonal projection. And then the transformation formula can be stated at the operator level by saying that if you look at a function um, which is L2 on omega 2, and you understand its Bergman projection, this is, oops, I know how to do this. This is this term right here. You can do that by looking at the Bergman projection of a pulled back function on omega 1. So, again, this is not, a, we're not trying for pedagogy here. Uh, you've, you've seen this or not, but you can believe this, I think, if you believe the, the um, transformation formula in the kernels. And that's why I want to talk about a little bit the first idea in this business. So, um, you'd like to control the thing on the left-hand side here being fed into B1. Remember, capital F is a biholomorphic map. V is, is at this point is maybe, you can think of it as smooth or just an L2. You do have a starting point for this problem. This kind of comes back to my little rev up about a balanced boundary value problem. After all, each of the component functions in capital F, which I'm denoting little f, are holomorphic and bounded. And so you do have Cauchy's estimates. And you do know that their derivatives are not behaving terribly at the boundary. They're blowing up algebraically, like the distance to the boundary and the number of derivatives you're taking. But, and then one um, knows or recalls a, a, a very well-known result in several complex variables that if omega is a strongly pseudo, or if, sorry, if omega is any smoothly bounded pseudo-convex domain, we can take a fractional power of a defining function and build a plurisubharmonic function. This function vanishes on the boundary like a defining function would, but is not smooth on the boundary. And a consequence of that fact is a, is a nice comparison result about under a biholomorphic map, uh, points are not sent dis uh, disastrously close to the boundary. Um, so R1 and R2 are the defining functions. R1 on omega 1, the input side, R2 on the output side. The inequality is saying the, the notation there with the squiggles is just that there are some constants involved saying that the distance that uh, the image point f of z is from the boundary of omega 2 is not comparable to the distance that, it, that z started out um, in omega 1, but it's, it's controllable. <laughs> I mean, if, if, if 1 over m was 1, then, the, then it would be a quasi-isometry. Right? So somehow it's something else. It's a algebraically quasi-isometry. But, um, but that's a nice fact. It's an extreme talks a little bit about, okay, the constants depend on f. You just think of the automorphisms of the disk. But they don't depend on where z is at. And Bell's idea now is to go back and use this very elementary fact one, that the derivatives of your map, uh, component functions of your map aren't terribly um, unbounded at the boundary. Or derivatives of those are not terribly unbounded. To try to do the following. He'd like given a smooth function on the boundary, find another function which has the same Bergman projection but vanishes on the boundary. And sort of if you can do it once, you can do it again and again. You can make it vanish to higher and higher order. And that's a way to slay, to, to counteract the possible blow up of the derivatives of the component functions little f through the transformation formula. Exactly. Okay, so you can do that, and it's, uh, it's, it's old news, again, for some, but not for everyone, maybe. Um, you look at functions that the Bergman projection sends to zero, and you notice that if you have any function of this form, an anti-holomorphic derivative of the defining function to a positive, say, integer power times a smooth function, 
you're definitely annihilated by the Bergman projection because you just integrate by parts. You throw this derivative over onto the kernel. It's anti-holomorphic in that slot, so it kills it. And there's no boundary term because of the r to a power. All right, and once you've noticed that, you just subtract well-chosen terms of this type. For, in other words, for different s's that are related to your function f to achieve these two little bullet points here. Okay. Now, a version of Bell's lemma works in the twisted weighted setup. Now we get to, I hope, the first really interesting new thing I have to say. Um, I need to drag out to be just semi-honest um, some notation. We have to look at some classes of functions that vanish on the boundary. This, this class, script v, super l, sub little l. These are the functions which are some um, multiplier b. b is smooth, but all I'm assuming about b is that it and its, um, its first capital L derivatives, no, sorry, little l derivatives are L infinity. So I'm not assuming that it's smooth up to the boundary already. This whole game, I mean, if you think about it, is uh, for this extension problem, is, um, is not to chase your tail. I mean, you, you, it's a beautiful idea to try to counterbalance the, um, uh, the Cauchy estimate information you have on the component functions with some kind of vanishing condition. But you have to do that in a way um, that doesn't already assume your thing is smooth up to the boundary, in which case it's trivial. So anyway, that's why some of this notation comes up. Um, good. Now, and instead of looking at, and sorry, there's a typo. That's supposed to be an unbarred derivative there. But instead of looking at just d by dzk, which we did in ordinary Bell, we pre-multiply by the, the weight to kill it. And the twist factor, because I'm going to be looking at not the holomorphic functions, remember, but the tau twisted ones, or t twisted ones here. Sorry, I changed notation on you. You with me? And then we get a theorem, or one gets a theorem, uh, more or less by just mimicking Bell's observation. Um, instead of reading it, I want to simply, I want to mainly emphasize that um, what happens is you can only consider functions of this type, instead of just some smooth function here. That was what Bell's was, right? Given, a, given an F smooth up to the boundary, build one that has the same Bergman projection and vanishes on the boundary. Now we have functions only of a special type. There's still a lot of them, but not everything. Don't pay attention so much to the B times S part as this factor in front. And for these, we can make something, we can construct a cousin of phi or we can construct something in the same uh, equivalence class with respect to the Bergman projection. I call it psi super m. And a version of it vanishes on the boundary. This is a vanishing condition, which you can, those of you that are interested can see on the, the slides that'll go on the web. OK. Um, now, the, the, OK, the issue, I think, hopefully, will come clear in this next slide. Um, so let's just recall the setup. We have this biholomorphic map. We've got a pair of twist weight fun functions on omega 1 and another pair on omega 2 that are connected by the biholomorphism. Now, it's very important that we connect the, the type of functions that the bj's reproduce. Remember, they're not reproducing holomorphic functions with the multiplier in front of sb here, or b, b times s, this thing that I ask you to focus on. Without that connection, there's sort of no hope to continue the, the, the line that Bell suggests. Uh, maybe I'm going to leave it at that statement, but, but, uh, but would be happy to talk about it later. I, I can add one little thing. You know that Cohn showed more than 40 years ago that there is a weighted projection operator and a weighted debar Neumann theory on all that operator has no, that operator does not have this connection I'm trying to allude to um, here. Namely, Cohn's projection is 
is a weighted projection, but it projects onto holomorphic functions. And the factor, e, he used the weight uh, k times the modulus of z squared. e to the k times uh, modulus z squared would have to appear in front of, of your bell trick, your bell lemma trick. And, um, and the projection doesn't, pro doesn't preserve anything of the form e to the k mod z squared times a holomorphic gadget. Right, OK. So this is really why uh, we need two parameters. And we define uh, something called Bell compatibility that I'm actually not going to lay out in front of you. That's several tedious slides. Uh, it roughly, though, says a so kind of take home message that e to the minus w, that's supposed to be an exponent, divided by the twist factor vanishes to high order on the boundary. Notice when, or uh, not quite vanishes to high order, sorry, uh, derivatives of it vanish to high order. Notice that if tau is 1 and w is 0, we're in the classical case. Of course, that's a constant function 1, and so it vanishes every place, or derivatives of it vanish every place. And then using this undefined Bell compatibility, we, def we make a definition modeled on condition R of Bell-Lagotska. Um, we have to have a Bell compatible family of weight, twist weight pairs, so that the square root of tau times the twisted weighted Bergman projection associated to that tau is smooth. And this is just quantified. The, the, the W spaces are Sobolev spaces. Uh, remark that it really does, it really is, for, for those of you that are quite familiar with this, it really is condition R. Uh, in the special case when tau is 1 and w is 0. But, um, but it's not the same regularity con condition in general. And this is interesting because this operator, so remember this projects onto the tau twisted holomorphic functions, but then I'm multiplying it by saying that would kill that. So this operator on the left is projecting onto holomorphic functions. Right? Sorry, so say it again. Get rid of the M in your mind. Just the square root of tau times the Bergman projection associated to tau comma W is a projection onto holomorphic functions. But it's not one that there's W around. <laughs> and so it's not doing, it's not projecting it orthogonally with respect to Lebesgue measure like B is. Okay. And then there's a theorem. Functional and out. If condition R holds, so yeah, condition script R holds, then, in fact, um, biholomorphic maps extend. Okay. Now, that's not what I really wanted to talk about today. What I'd like to use the last part of my time to talk about is how you would, how you would show that R, script R holds. That's a regularity theorem, and it's a, actually a PDE regularity theorem more than a fact about Bergman projections, although those are tied together. So some notation, I need to talk about the Hessian, complex Hessian of a function, which I'll read as I dd bar g applied to u comma u. Um, I'm just going to flash this because either it's just second nature to you or who the heck cares. Uh, there's going to be first derivative expressions. I'll read those. Those are always going to be like I d g wedge d bar g. But what it means is written out in coordinates on the right. And, and now maybe is a, a decent time to talk about, or to at least write on the board, this thing I mentioned before, the difference between pseudoconvexity and uh, so pseudoconvexity means this for all L in the so-called complex tangent space to the boundary. Which I'll be sloppy with notation, whereas Plurry subharmonic in this notation of, of the defining function, say R, means this for all directions. And so it turns out a very big um, and interesting, I would say, not unfortunate, uh, source of theorems in several complex variables is the difference between these two kind of conditions. And certainly that's true in, in our story. <coughs> okay. Right. So we want to look at a um, substitute for the Dolbeau complex that has something to say about our system, so we've defined. 
and what I write down here is uh, is is it. So um, maybe the next slide elaborates a little bit. So um, the symbols here to, to to move from functions to zero one forms first multiply by the square root of tau and then act on it by d bar. To go from one forms to two forms, I'm going to take out my one form, act on it by d bar, and then post multiply by square root of tau. Right, so that's simple enough. Maybe the very, but, but it is important that this is very different than Hormander's weighting scheme. So d bar, of course, is a first order operator. We're changing d bar at the first order level. Hormander weighting scheme doesn't, it, it changes it at the zero order level. Or it changes, it doesn't change d bar at all, actually, in the usual way to talk about Hormander, but it changes d bar star at the zeroth order level. Now that's a big difference, um, as it turns out, for, for point of view of estimates. And that's what we, that's all that matters. So, um, right, so I, I recast the Hormander weighting scheme just quickly. You, you could talk about it as changing the d bar operator, but conjugating the d bar operator by the twos are there because just to make the thing work out with the previous notation. And then you just compute the ordinary Dirichlet form of that Laplacian. This is the sort of point of view that Witten took. On the, on the real Laplacian when he reintroduced a Hormander weighting scheme. And then the comment I already made, d bar and this uh, conjugated version of d bar agree to first order, but these two operators don't. Okay. Then a few more. Obviously, the pre multiplication factor, capital script T1, I guess it is, is the first operator from functions to one. Point. Second one is T2. Uh, probably getting dizzy. Shifts the null space just like we'd want to connect this to the to the Bergman projection, the twisted Bergman projection. I do want to mention that the post multiplication factor isn't really needed for to make things a complex because after all, how you just d bar squared equals zero. But if you don't put it in there, then the, the, the form of the basic estimate is is just atrocious. If you do put it in there, a kind of nice symmetry happens and we get something decent to write down. And then the last little comment, so readable later. All right, so um, the following, so you, you, you simply want to um, do what you always do, unravel the Dirichlet form and see what you get. We'll sloppily, instead of uh, more formally like a differential geometer, talking about curvature terms, having some kind of curving um, measurement, We'll talk about curvature terms as any darn thing that comes out of integration by parts and, and that we can group together in an intelligent way. And that really is what curvature terms are from an analyst's point of view. But anyway, uh, if we take our smoothly bounded domain, normalized defining function is just, don't worry about that. Uh, so integration by parts looks a little simpler. And we take a twist and a weight function. Right now, let's make them smooth up to the boundary. Then I write down the twisted estimate like this. Um, and you'll notice at least, well, but then I had a little time this morning and I thought that looked like too many moving parts because I have a new factor A that I'm putting into this formulation, but notice that there's no derivatives of A involved in the thing. This is just a Cauchy-Schwartz um, factor. And so maybe it looks a little simpler if we just set A equal to tau and we write down this as our sort of Heart of the basic estimate, right? In this case, clearly on the left is the Dirichlet form for the Laplacian associated with this twisted weighted setup. That's the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, I get a bunch of curvature terms, or integration by parts terms, plus a boundary integral. All right now, um, notice that this, of course, um, has a special cases the formulas you're familiar with from Hormander. If tau is one, then that's gone, that's gone, <laughs> that's, that little tau is gone, and you just get Hormander's inequality. But you have a really interesting uh, interplay now between pluri subharmonic conditions on W and pluri superharmonic conditions on tau. Although, I would say this third term is always an obstruction to this thing being positive, because the numerator is positive, Remember what it is, it's just the, yeah, and the denominator tau is assumed to be a positive function. So um, call that thing something, that thing in curly braces, we'll call it theta. Um, and then a few 
quick remarks before we, right? So of course only useful if we can make that thing positive, even for just L2 boundedness, let alone any sort of other estimates that we might want. Um, and so, right, so this was, this should have been deleted because this is from another set of talks. Uh, let's, let's just delete it by going through it fast. So that was the comment that the third term is an obstruction to positivity. There's a lot of play to this new inequality. It, 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 it should strike you as a rather simple idea. It is, for sure, to introduce this factor tau. But it's a lot like passing um, um, from Poincaré's inequality, classical Poincaré inequality on the Lapl real Laplacian, to Hardy-like inequalities, where you have weights, or uh, weights that involve distance to the boundary on both sides. And there's theorems you just can't prove from, from classical point Cray that you can from Hardy and similarly here. So this was all blah blah about that. But now let's, um, let's state a theorem and try to talk about the regularity a little bit. So uh, the theorem is that there always exists on a smoothly bounded pseudoconvex domain uh, these Bell compatible family of twist weight pairs that have the, the regularity property. And then hence we get a corollary about extension of biholomorphic maps. Roughly, how does this go? Well, um, we want to introduce the, the D-bar Neumann, the twisted D-bar Neumann problem in this context. And, um, and I just write down the Laplacian here. Right? This is the way it unfolds. The tau's kind of, the square root of tau, sorry, kind of gang up to become a pre-multiplier or a intermediate multiplier of tau in between these two first order operators. And then you have a cone formula, a cone-like formula or cone-spencer-like formula that the twisted weighted Bergman projection, that's script B, I've dropped its decoration, but it's the same, it's the same tau and W, is the identity operator minus um, the adjoint going from functions to one forms, inverse of the Laplacian, principal operator, principal gradient. Right? I say it, say it in that way because that's really, that's what the Hodge theorem is about, or the, the cone formula is about. And this is proved in the usual way. But now something really interesting happens. Actually, for, for, the, for the positive theorem that I just am hoping to introduce you to today, this is really where all the action <laughs> happens, even though I haven't talked about a single commutator yet. The operator we want to look at is the square root of tau times script B. That's the regularity. Uh, having this be regular at various Sobolev scales is what was required for condition script R. I'm just going to call that operator P. But notice there's a ganging up here of the square root of tau outside of script B here and the square root of tau that appears here in Cohn's formula. And it gives us a positive tau. Right? That just doesn't happen. One times one is one if you use regular Cohn's formula. Right? There's no ganging up. But square root of tau times the square root of tau is tau squared. And so if, if, tau, so if tau is small near the boundary, that could be of great, great use to you. Right? Because tau squared is, or sorry, tau is smaller if tau is going to zero at the boundary than the square root of tau is. That's all. Okay. In the previous slide, you yeah. have the plain identity. You have the identity and the identity. Does it be like a script tau times Oh, there absolutely should on this second line. Thanks, Andy. Uh, right here. Right. You just multiply, and so you're absolutely right. Okay. I, I do want to sketch. Um, I'm sorry. I'm supposed to stop when? I do want to stop on time. Now? Oh, at 11. Okay, excellent. Um, for me, at least. Uh, <laughs> please bear with me. But maybe this will be interesting. I hope so. Um, even though the, the connection between the twist and the weight factor is very, very important, the new ingredient that I wanted to share with you is about how tau can cause regularity of, of a Laplacian, like I just wrote down, to happen. How weights can do it are known to many experts in this room through the work of Cohn and others. You just create a big Hessian, you start commuting derivatives, and it's a, it's a great triumph of pseudo-differential operators, but it's also by 2014, well understood mathematics. Tau is, is not so much like that. Okay. And so I mentioned, yeah, the new feature is that tau is doing the work um, of getting enough positivity on 
the term I called theta, that curvature term, to be able to allow us to commute derivatives by the projection. Any kind of regularity theorem, of course, you're, you've got to ultimately talk about how do you get derivatives past your operator. There's no nothing else. Um, right, so let's talk about that. So script B now will be the, there'll be a tau involved, but there's no weight. And P, the operator we're trying to understand, we want to prove some kind of an estimate like this, where the script parentheses S is supposed to denote Sobolev norms. Right, we want to talk about, so we're not, in other language, we're not just talking about regularity, but we're going to talk about something called exact regularity. The number, the S number, S number of derivatives of PF can be dominated by S, same S number of derivatives of F. All right, um, now there's a, so the type, yeah, good, reduction to estimate in one direction. There's something that goes on here that's very standard, but we need to get, talk about it a little bit. If we look at this vector field called capital X, notice two things. It's tangential, but it's not in this complex tangent space, which is denoted differently. Or it's, or rather, sorry, it's in, the com it's in the tangent space, but it's not, it's neither a zero, one vector, whoops, that'd be that one, or a one, zero vector. This is a so-called bad direction, where a lot of analysis in this subject happens. But since f is a holomorphic function, it's not difficult to show that s Sobolev derivatives of pf really are controlled by just these special derivatives, up to order s, of course, of pf. That's just essentially the ellipticity of the d-bar system. All right, so no, no, nothing new yet. But now, so um, let's just obviously just take one derivative. It's New York, New York. If you can make it there, you, I mean, there's getting to one derivative is everything. Uh, okay. So I want to look. So so I've hopefully convinced you that really what we're looking at is the L2 norm of one special derivative x of pf, and I want to understand it. One basic idea, but it's been used many times by others, is to use Cohn's formula to expand that L2 inner product, but just in one half of the inner product. Um, and then some very standard manipulations, which I'm not writing on the board, um, reduce you to understanding how this derivative, this one vector field, commutes with this operator, and everything else is controllable. All right? Asking for a little article of faith, but it's true. Okay. And what is that main commutator? So, first of all, notice this is not the square root of tau, but it's tau, because of this ganging up thing I talked about. And you can, uh, that's not true. Actually, the tau I'll choose is not really tangential. It's, uh, I should have put a squiggle there. But, but if, I, if you allow me the liberty of saying that commutator is essentially this commutator, um, with tau already pulled out plus OK terms, then that first line is correct. Okay. What I want to do is give you a spirit of the idea, of course, not inundate with technicalities. And so the second squiggle is just that, well, W, which I had thrown away before anyways, now pretend it's back, it doesn't matter for that commutator. And what is the fact that, well, now you do a computation, you do an honest computation, and uh, this bad direction commutes with d bar in such a way that you exactly get the complex Hessian of the defining function, but not acting on a vector, acting on a anti-holomorphic derivative of the various components of u. Sorry, u is your 0, 1 form, and u is related to f by just being script n of d bar square root of tau times f. Plus some, these are okay terms. These are going to be estimatable by our basic estimate. And with a little bit of manipulation, you can actually rewrite this using this notation as I D D bar R. Well, that's what that kind of a thing looks like. But acting on a vector, a der some derivatives of U, interproducted with some things that aren't derivatives of U. Well, you can imagine that actually. There's some derivatives of U. You just have to you have to just do a little bit of, of work. And this notation for the experts is that x tilde differs from x in the sense that x tilde acting on you preserves the, the domain of the adjoint operator. So I can feed it into the basic estimate. Two minutes? Yep. Good. Perfect. So everything's been reduced modulus handwriting. And 
using this, just showing that this kind of an object is dominated by the civil level of function f. And I do want you to notice the mixed application, sorry, what I mean by mixed application, it's not the same vector in this slot and in this slot. The natural idea at this point would be to use the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality, right? And write this term that we're trying to understand, or at least the integrand of the term we're trying to understand, like this. Notice, boom, you get a tau squared here, which is awfully useful. I mean, again, tau, which I haven't defined for you, is going to be something like the Diedrich Fourness, or it's going to be something like a defining function. It's going to be small near the boundary. And so that's even smaller. That's the really important thing. We can't apply the Cauchy-Schwartz exactly because of this. Uh, we're not assuming that our domain is, a, is defined by a Polaris harmonic function. We're just assuming it's pseudo-convex. But let's see what we would try to play out in my 90 seconds left. We would add and subtract a term and use something that I dub d bar Hardy inequality, which maybe in the interest of brevity, I would say that to those people that think about the d bar Neumann problem, you know this inequality in the case s equals 0, even if you haven't whoops, played with it recently. Um, s equals 0, then the right-hand side of the inequality becomes the ordinary Dirichlet form for the d bar Neumann problem. And my zapper is gone. Um, and anyway, it holds in general. Sorry. And now I at least need to give you, I need to t show you what tau looks like. Tau is minus phi in this improved Diedrich Fourness theorem. So it's not really a defining function. Oh, it's back. So um, my, this is a negative function. I need tau to be positive. So I put a plus sign here, and that's my tau. But, or that's one of my taus. It depends on delta. It's going to, delta is going to be chosen smaller and smaller as I take more and more derivatives. Right? We were just concentrating on getting one derivative by. We've got to get lots of derivatives by. Um, but the key thing, I think I have a wrap-up slide. There's some comments. Right. We get this kind of a, of a diagram. Um, the thing we wanted to control, we work to get it controlled like this by essentially standard methods, the first line. Then using the twisted estimate, or sorry, then using Cauchy-Schwartz, and I get a term that I have to control. And finally, that's bounded by a small constant, which is in boldface, exactly because of this tau squared here. You got to have a gain, or all regularity theorems I know of, there may be some sophisticated ones, you have to have some gain to, to start absorbing error terms. And the gain in our business is this, is this tau factor. So take home or, or a real summary message. I, needed the, I need the twist and the weight in order to execute Bell's program. If I just try to weight the problem, I might get regularity, but I get nothing about biholomorphic maps. I need both factors. Now, it's a, it's a different kind of observation that the, the twist factor actually helps me prove regularity in a way that one doesn't. And, um, and thank you very much for listening. And, what yeah. sort of other regularity theorems do you think you'd be able to use this um, method for besides uh, the extended model? Right, excellent question. Um, I'm not sure in my particular case, I'm an old man and getting older, and, um, <laughs> but I think there's a lot of theorems here, actually. I mean, um, Even just forgetting about the Hormander weight and just concentrating on the Laplacian with this tau factor builds you different solutions to the D-bar problem. They have different L2 estimates. And if tau is chosen correctly, you get, nevertheless, they're smooth up to the boundary. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great question, but it's one that I don't have a really great answer to. Right? You're all of a sudden, in a sense, all of a sudden, although Cohn's result really pointed this, to this as well, in a situation of a plethora of um, solution operators to the D-bar problem, the ordinary D-bar problem, which are all smoothed up to the boundary but all different from each other, surely some information can be extracted from that. But you know, I don't know.
I can't really even speculate quite, but I would, but I would love to see some of those things worked out. How one, yeah, anyway. Any extension results? Well, to biholomorphic yeah, maps? With this twist. Just with the twist, no. From a subway, I think. Oh, I see. Right, right. No, yeah, I mean, um, yes. So, Ozawa Takagoshi kind of theorems, uh, that's actually how I got interested in this in the first place. And so, right, extending uh, holomorphic, say, um, functions off of hyperplanes or, or more curved surfaces using this twisting idea. That, I, I would want to give credit where credit's due. That's the original Ozawa idea, and that's his idea. I mean, but, but I think the new piece is to show uh, that if you consider, instead of, so if for Ozawa, um, what I called tau today was a perturbation factor. Fair enough, I mean, like Hardy's inequality, which I mentioned in the analogy. For me, it's not, it's the principal operator. And there is a kind of big difference, it just and that does lead to better of Osawa Takahashi type. Yeah, Marco. Sorry. Any, any idea of the domains where the condition R, script R, is valid then? That aren't pseudoconvex? No. I mean, so, so again, I'm, I'm announcing or t uh, advertising. All smoothly bounded pseudoconvex domains satisfy condition script R. But I really think it's going to take new ideas to get beyond that because I, I lean heavily on a, an improved version of Diedrich Fornes theorem, and that's a, that's a pseudoconvex phenomenon. So I, no, I don't have an even good guesses as soon as you start having concavity. Let's thank our speaker again.